let's talk about Block and Key, a puzzly game from an award-winning publisher. Welcome to Brains on Games. I'm Dr. Brian McDonald. In this episode, we're going to talk about a very puzzly game from the folks at Inside Up Games. These are the guys who created Earth, which is a game that won the medium weight game of the year at Board Game Geek not too long ago. But what we're talking about is a puzzly game called Block and Key by Inside Up Games. This is a game that was given to me. They gave me the demo copy when I was at Breakout. So it's another one of those Breakout demos. So uh, I, I walked by the Inside Up table again and again, hoping that somebody would show me how to play this block and key game, but everybody was very busy demoing Earth. So I didn't get to try it out at the convention, but they gave me their demo copy at the end so that I could share it with you today. Block and Key is a game for between one and four players. The box says age 14 and up, but I think younger kids can figure this one out. Uh, and the games take only 20 to 40 minutes to play. Let's take a deeper look at Block and Key by Inside Up Games. This is a tower of a game, a two level game. The box opens up and you put these supports on it uh, and the top and bottom of the box become the game board. Block and Key is light. It's very easy to figure out this game. It's light in terms of its complexity. What you're trying to do is earn victory points by solving puzzles. You're claiming keys, block and key. You're using blocks to claim keys, hence the name of the game. But you're trying to be the player who earns the most points at the end by building these puzzles. The game will end once a player has claimed a certain number of keys, and that's going to vary based on the number of players in the game. Turns in Block and Key are super simple. You've got a choice of doing one of two things. You can either take more pieces, excavating from the bottom of the board, or place a piece on the top of the board. If you excavate, you're just taking one row or one column of these shapes from the excavation site here underneath. And they're shapes, they're like little Tetris blocks that you're, that you're taking from under there. So it's a three by three grid. You might not be able to see the whole thing on the little camera, but it's a three by three grid. You're going to take an entire row or an entire column of shapes. Now you have a maximum number of seven that you can have before you place them on the board. So you might find yourself, you know, discarding some of the shapes that you took. Towards the end of the game, there's going to be empty spaces here because you won't have enough blocks to fill everything up. Uh, and then it becomes more strategic, I think, when you're deciding which pieces you want to take and how many you're going to get. You might, instead of excavating, you might decide to place a piece on the board here on top. So once you've got a few pieces, and I should mention, each player also has a secret mission that they're trying to accomplish, meaning that uh, you, you want to have a certain number of faces that you can see from your side of the board. It's always from the player's perspective. So in this case, for every three green faces that I can see from my position at, on the board, I'm going to get one extra victory point. So you are thinking about those colors, but you're also thinking about the keys that you have in your hand. You'll start with a certain number of these, uh, and you've got some easy ones that are worth one point. So if I've got a stack of white, two white and two brown on top of each other or beside each other, because you can rotate these things uh, in order to solve them, I could claim this key. Uh, the medium weight or the medium difficulty, I guess, they've got suns on the back and underneath you might be able to see there's a deck of sun and moon cards. The moon is the most difficult. So here's a two point puzzle where you need to have a, a stack of three green faces and three white faces with one empty space in between. It doesn't have to be empty. It could have any other color in the middle. So empty uh, spaces on this grid here on your, your key cards um, they could be any block at all. They don't have to actually be empty when you're claiming, claiming the key. Um, and then you've got the most difficult puzzles. The moon puzzles, they're worth four points at the end. They are much harder to achieve these ones. Uh, and then as soon as you claim a key, so you place a block, you check to see if you can claim any of your keys. Um, sometimes other players have placed blocks that might allow you to finish your puzzle, but you have to contribute to the puzzle in order to claim the key. So if I look and there's already a pattern like this on the board at the start of my turn, I can't claim it. I need to find a way to get another white block or, or something so that I'm contributing to the puzzle. Then you get to choose. Once you've claimed the key, you get to choose a new key and you choose from either the medium difficulty, the sun cards or the moon cards, uh, which are going to give you more points. But it's a race to the finish because you're going to be watching 
uh, how many of the keys the other players have claimed because that's what's going to determine the ending of the game. There are a few rules to placing these pieces on the board. You have to be next to a piece that's already placed. Uh, so if you go diagonally, I can get uh, a green face to go here like this. That's no problem. If it's diagonal, it doesn't matter the height or the orientation or anything like that, you're good to go. However, if two faces touch, then the block that's touching, when I, the block that I place has to be taller than the face that it's touching. So I could place a block like this where it's touching a face here of this cube that starts out on the board at the beginning of the game. I could not lie this piece sideways like this unless it's diagonal. So I could place one here like that, but I could not place it like this because it's not tall enough. The blocks can stack up and that makes things more challenging. As the, as the height goes up, it does become harder to place a taller block. The maximum height is six, and then you can't place something that's touching that, that very tall tower. You can create a straight bridge by placing a piece like this, as long as both sides are supported and it's straight across, but you can't have an overhang. So I couldn't have a piece, let me see here. I, I can place this piece like this because it's taller, but I couldn't have a piece like this one and put this on because it's hanging over. Now I also couldn't do that because there's already a piece on here, it's the same height. I would have to place this on top, maybe like this. Uh, and one thing I'll, I'll mention is that these two faces are touching, but this one still can be placed because part of the block is higher. It doesn't have to be the tall face that's touching uh, the other face. I can place this this way or that, it doesn't matter as long as one part of the block that I'm adding here to the board is taller than the one that is touching. And I, I mean, that's the game. You either excavate, you place a piece, you check to see if you've solved a puzzle or you can claim a key, you draw a new key if you've done that, play goes on to the next player, you keep going until someone has claimed a particular number of keys, then you're gonna start counting up victory points. What skills though are you working on when you play block and key? Well, this is a game that's about visual spatial problem solving. There's a few things that you're doing here and they are things that we, skills that we measure when we're assessing kids uh, for learning issues, visual spatial skills. Some of the tests that I use in, in my job involve visual analysis. So breaking down a puzzle like this into its parts uh, and then synthesis of you're comparing it to what's on the board. So there's a visual analysis and synthesis. There's also mental rotation because these cards can be turned in any way to solve the puzzle. This one is sort of symmetrical, so it doesn't matter that much, but you know, you could have a horizontal with uh, white on the bottom and green on top, or you could do it the other way around, or they could be straight up and down, or you could turn it upside down and they're in the other direction. So there is a mental rotation activity here. You could physically rotate the cards, but you're kind of looking at the faces that you can see from your perspective on the board and trying to match things up. Now you are planning ahead and budgeting those blocks and, and making some strategic choices that are going to have an impact on your long-term goal of having the right faces of a particular color facing you at the end of the game. And anytime you're playing a game where, and, and any strategy game does this, if you're planning ahead or budgeting, those are examples of executive functioning skills. The skills and behaviors that you need to work towards a goal. You've got the long-term goal of making sure you've got a certain color face that's facing in your direction so that you can get extra victory points. You've got the shorter or medium-term goals of placing pieces on the board so that you can claim those keys. And you're also kind of keeping an eye on the other players and how many keys they've claimed because you've got to plan, if I complete one, which deck am I going to draw from? Am I going to race and try to complete a bunch of small ones while the other players are trying to build their big puzzles? Or do I need to, uh, can, I, can I afford to wait a little while longer and, and build a more complicated puzzle that's going to be worth twice as many points at the end of the game? Final thoughts about block and key. Well, this is a game where, I mean, it is a real tactile experience. The pieces have a great weight to them and they're, they're fun to handle uh, and to put together on the board. 
it, you know, a lot of the times players would be like building little puzzles in front of them with the pieces that, that they had while other players were thinking about their turn. You've got this beautiful, like super thick bag that's embroidered with the block and key logo and inside up games on there. And that's where you're drawing pieces from to place them, to replace the ones that you've drafted from the bottom of the board. Uh, and even the sound it makes when you pick it up, you know, there's a satisfying sensory experience here. Uh, and as I said, it is a tactile game. You've, you've got the table presence. This is not a table hog. It does not take up a lot of room. Might be hard to tell from the little camera. But you've got this neat little tower that you're building, uh, and it's played on two levels. And somebody walking by and seeing this, well, literally, this is what I did. I stopped and did a double take to say, what is that? I want to learn more about this game. These pieces look really cool, and you're, you're building this neat little tower. Um, so the components are fun. The box becomes the board. That's kind of an interesting little puzzle to build. You've got these supports are inside the box and then there's good instructions for how to fit everything together so it stands up at the end. Um, and you're also working on these puzzles with these great pieces of different, you know, I, I keep saying Tetris pieces because the pieces are exactly like the, those, those Tetris blocks that I remember from when I was uh, playing that game as a kid. Um, so you've got great pieces. Uh, visually, it's interesting. Um, it's got great table presence. It's just the weight of the pieces, the feel of them in your hand, the sound that they make when they rattle around, the fact that you've got that nice, <laughs> I'm making noise as I'm touching it, that nice embroidered bag uh, to put those pieces in. Um, what a, a neat package uh, we're talking about here. Are, are there downsides though? I mean, if you if you like these kinds of puzzly games, I mean, this is exactly, you know, you're transforming this 3D puzzle into a 2D puzzle to match up your, your cards, the puzzles on your cards. Um, it's a great puzzly game. My worry is, the downside for me is this. Um, I, I worry that when you're taking apart and putting the board back together, that it might wear out over time. It is thick cardboard. Um, but it is cardboard, and it, it's possible that you might get some wear and tear, and this thing might become more wobbly as you're, you know, over the years as you're taking it out and putting it back. Now, I received this in March. This was the demo that they had. It was an open box, so other people had already played with it. I've taken it out and put it back together several times and haven't had any trouble here. But, you know, that would be my one concern about this thing. But what a fun little game. I mean, I have to thank the folks at Inside Up for sharing this with me and allowing me to share it with you. Um, I am looking forward to, I backed Earth for the Abundance expansion on Kickstarter. That's their award winner from last year. So I'm really looking forward to uh, receiving that and trying that out. Uh, so thanks so much to Inside Out Games for sharing this. If you have any comments, if you have any questions, you can leave them, of course, in the comment section below the video, or you can email me at brian at brainsongames.ca. Brainsongames.ca is the website. That's where future episodes will go. The previous ones are already up there. Brains on Games is the X handle on the Facebook page and the Instagram feed, so we're all over the place. And if you enjoyed this video and you want to be notified of future ones, you can head on over to YouTube and click that subscribe button. Thanks for joining me, and hopefully I'll see you next time. Thank you.